And when he talked with the Jews, there was the same argument going on all the time. And the Jews, they really thought that they were beyond judgment and that Abraham himself would be sitting at the gates of hell and not permit anyone, any Jew, to go to hell, whether he'd been circumcised or not. Even though they taught that circumcision was their salvation. I mean, they really had it twisted, but before we judge them, let's look at the world today and the denomination, Christian denominations that are depending upon baptism, depending upon church, uh, being a member of a church, I mean, uh, doing communion, I mean, all these different things that they're depending upon for their salvation, and Paul wanted to make it perfectly clear, none of that will save you. Circumcision wouldn't save you. It was a token. It was actually a sign that sin is passed on from generation to generation. I don't think people realize what that, what that all was about. I mean, yeah, it was a token of the covenant, but it actually was telling them that sin was passed on from generation to generation. Circumcision was a sign of the sin that needed to be cut off. And Paul makes this clear, too, as we get on into the book of Romans. But the Jews, I mean, they just thought they had it made. They didn't have to worry about salvation. And that's why when Paul came on the scene and started preaching about grace, they accused him of preaching a new gospel, a new religion. They believed, they actually have it written in their books. Uh, there's one special book they had that they read on the Book of Jubilee, which is a apocryphal book that I think Catholics have it in their Bible. I'm not sure I have to look in my Catholic Bible. But they teach that Abraham didn't sin. And they used Abraham as their example of righteousness. And that they were the seed of Abraham so there was no way they would ever go to hell. And they teach that Abraham didn't sin, so therefore his sons, Isaac and Jacob, didn't sin. He never lied. And this was, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> okay, don't argue with me. This is what the Jews were saying. And see, this was, the, this was the argument that Paul was facing all the time. And he, he spent chapter 1 and chapter 2 and most of chapter 3 trying to explain to them, look, the whole world is guilty. There's no one who's righteous. No, not one. For all of sin comes short of the glory of God. And the Jews were sitting there, yeah, that doesn't mean us. That's just the Gentiles. And he's trying, we, we're the seed of Abraham. You remember that, don't you? You know, he eventually he tells them, look, I'm the seed of Abraham. But Abraham was saved. The only way that a man can be saved back then and now is by faith. <laughs> Faith. He believed God. He didn't believe in God. He believed God. And there's a difference between believing in God. I mean, the Muslims believe in God. The Hindus believe in God. You know? They believe in God. Abraham believed God. It was his faith that saved him. It was the grace of God through his faith. And this was the message that Paul was trying to explain to the Jews, and the Jews just kept, no, wait a minute, Abraham, Abraham is our father, we're the seed of Abraham, so therefore, we're saved, we don't have to worry about going to hell. And so he wrote, to, even the book of Hebrews was written to the Hebrews to show them that the sacrifices did not save them. They set five sacrifices a day, did not save them. The Day of Atonement did not save them. Their garments did not save them. Their feast days did not save them. He was trying to make it clear to them, none of these religious rituals, none of these things can save you. It's by grace that you're saved, through faith, believing God. That's how they, how they got saved. Now think about it. They believed the law would save them. They really believed keeping the law. Even though they could not keep the law, they believed keeping the law could save them. But they used Abraham, now get this, they used Abraham as their example, and Abraham was 430 years before yes. the law. And so Paul points out, well, wait a minute. <laughs> Abraham wasn't under the law. You know, that was, that was 430 years later. 
that the law came, and yet you're using Abraham. So he really had a battle with the Jews, back and forth and back and forth. And even to this day, they believe the ones who are spiritual, I won't say Christian, I'll say the ones who are spiritual still believe in, in trying to keep the law and believing that because they are Jewish, they will go to heaven. They are the covenant people. How sad that is, how blinded they are. But then we come here to the United States and other places of the world, and we see how they are putting their faith in so many strange things, and, and none of them is going to save them. None of them. So if you look in Romans chapter 3, <coughs> let me get over here to Romans chapter 3, and we'll see after chapter 1, I mean, he... They, the Jews said, you've attacked everybody, but now that you, now you've attacked us. And, and because you have attacked us, you've actually attacked God himself. And he spends chapter 1 and chapter 2 explaining to them about their sin being against God, even, and that God is no respecter of persons. But they would argue back and forth and back and forth with him. If you look in verse 9 of chapter 3, we have the final verdict. <laughs> he says, what then? After all these arguments with these Jews, because remember, the first ch church was Jewish. Almost all Jewish. Okay? He said, what then? Are we better than they? No, in no wise, for we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin. And the Jews said, not us. We have five daily sacrifices. We have the Day of Atonement. You know, we let that go go. We killed that cheap. <laughs> not us. We're not under sin. Only those Gentiles are under sin. Do you realize, he says, Abraham was a Gentile? Abraham was a Gentile. He, was the, he became a Jew when God said, you're a Jew. Right. In fact, he said, you're a Hebrew. You're a Hebrew. Okay. Judaism was the true faith. But here's where the Jews messed up. Is they were putting their faith in their religion. They were putting their faith in their temple. They were putting their faith in their rituals and their traditions. And you can see how easy it was for Paul to turn that around and look at the Gentiles and the church, and how they're doing exactly the same thing. Exactly the same thing. And he says, the whole world is guilty. And he says, we're going to use Abraham. Let's, let's use Abraham as your example. And that's what he does in chapter 4. But let's finish reading here in chapter 3. He says, uh, both Jews and Gentiles, that they are all under sin. God's no respecter of persons. You're all sinners. All of us. He says, as it is written, there is none righteous. No, not one. Can you imagine how a Jew, and I know I've, ever since I've studied the feast days, <clears throat> and I'm working on them again, how awesome it must have been to be a Jew at that time and actually get saved and see what it had all really meant. Wow, that's what that means. Wow, that's what that means. Can you imagine how when the light went on, wow, Passover is Calvary and unleavened bread is the burial and the first fruits is the resurrection. You can see how Paul was on, he was on fire for the Lord because he saw the reality of all of it. Where the rest of them were still seeing it as just rituals, what they were doing to get through the day and through the year. And he can't, even the the Jewish believers today, the Messianic Jews, they are, they are Jews and they're saved, but what they, most of them are trying to do is bring Israel back in, just like they did in Galatians. Well, we can have this and this. We can have Jesus as our Messiah and we can still do all the feast days and, and do the sacrifices, and we just want you to come back with us. Rather than you come out of that, they want us to come back to them, so they're saying, get back to your roots. 
So you can see how even that, as, as good as it sounds to get back to the roots, and I, and I do believe that because this is a Jewish book, how Satan is, is spinning that and using that to get the Gentiles to come back to the Jews. And it's just like when the church was first formed, how the Jews, well, they wanted all that, but they didn't want to give up all their rituals and their traditions. Just like today, well, I want all that, but I don't want to give up my denomination, my church, my cemetery, you know, all those things. I just don't want to give them up. This is my pew. My name's on it. I don't want to give this up. Well, the, and we look at the Jews and say, what was wrong with them? Well, I have to look at us and say, what's wrong with us? And that's what Paul was doing. So you can see, Paul was not very well liked. No. Because he didn't side with either side. He was telling them the truth. So they hated him for it. They hated him for it. And he wasn't perfect by no means. But he was giving them the word of God. And they didn't want to hear it. They didn't want to hear it. Let's go on. He said, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. Can you see all the Jews sitting there thinking, wow, we did five daily sacrifices a day. Are you telling us that none of that is worthwhile? We did the Day of Atonement. Are you telling us none of that is worthwhile? And then you think about the so-called Christians who will get on their knees and actually crawl for miles to get to an altar and think that is atonement for their sin. How many times, and you've seen it on TV, where they will crawl up the steps, some of the Catholics who will crawl up the steps, blood just running from their legs to get to the top to bow down to an idol, thinking that is saving them. And then we hear Paul and we hear the Jews say, wait a minute, we want to have our sacrifice. And we think, what is wrong with them? You've got to look at the world. Oh, what is wrong with them? There's actually several people who crucify themselves every year. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> every year. And then there's the groups who beat themselves, just constantly beat themselves. And we see thousands of them beating themselves with these rods and blood running all over their back, thinking they're atoning for their sins. He, Paul says, you don't even understand what you're doing. You, do you understand what you're doing when you slay that lamb? Do you understand what you're doing? And he said, you don't even understand it. But yet you're just doing it. So what does that mean? Absolutely nothing. Nothing. It's just like baptism. Baptism will not save you. It won't. But how many millions of people believe that baptism has saved them? How many? Millions, literally millions of people. There is none that understand it, he said. No, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of the asp is under their lips. He's talking about the religious ones who are teaching these untruths. You can see, he, he, he wasn't too gentle. Okay? whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. The way of peace have they not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. I mean, he, you can, can you hear the anger? Mm -hmm. Why? Because he knew, here they are, religious, very spiritual, trying to keep the law, but yet going to split hell wide open. He said, now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them that are under the law. <laughs> that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may be guilty before God. See, they believe, wow, remember when they were given the law? And what did they say? You just tell us what to do and we'll do it. <laughs> you know? What were they saying? We don't need you. <laughs> Just give us your list of to-dos and to-don'ts and we'll do all the ones that you want us to do. It was a works salvation. And that's what we see today. And many of the denominations that teach a works salvation right. also teach that you can lose it if you don't work hard enough. 
You can lose that salvation. So he says, there's no peace in what you're saying. Where's the peace of God? Where's the peace with God? If you have worked for it, that's your wage. That's a wage. You've earned the wage, but not eternal life. Because works will not save you, circumcision will not save you, sacrifices will not save you, baptism will not save you. He's saying none of these things will save you. But they say, how about Abraham? He's, well, what about Abraham? And then he spends a little time talking to him about Abraham and a little time talking to him about David. Because they like to point back. <laughs> look at Abraham. Look at David. They like to look back. What are they looking to? Man. Man, now keep in mind, he's talking to the church in Rome here. The Jews who, who actually want to keep their old religion, but yet they also believe in Jesus Christ, but they haven't put their full faith in him, and that's what it takes. Our faith in him. Plus nothing else. I, I thought a lot about John Wayne. I know that sounds silly, but <laughs> how he spent his whole life as a Protestant. And then as he was dying, he had him call in a Catholic priest because he wanted to have all his bases covered. So was he saved? No. I don't believe he was. Why? Because he didn't put his complete faith in, Jesus, in what Jesus Christ has done. He had to add something else to it. And if you add something else to it, guess what? You haven't put your complete faith in him, and that's what it takes. I mean, look at Abraham. What a man of faith. I mean, God called him his friend. It's the only one in the Bible where you find that God says, Abraham, my friend. He's my friend. He didn't live under the law. There was no law for 430 years. You know how he was saved? Chapter 4 tells us, through grace. Because why? He believed. Faith. Faith. He was saved by grace through his faith in the Lord. He believed. And how do we know he believed? Huh. Well, he was called out of his home. He was a Gentile. His family worshipped idols. They worshipped the sun god. In fact, that's why he took his father to Herod. I mean, God called him to a land that he didn't even know where he was going, but he took a detour and took his father to Herod where his father could worship the sun god in Herod. He was a Gentile. But he was willing to lay down his life. He was willing to kill his son. By his faith, he believed God. And it didn't happen overnight. In fact, all the promises that was given to Abraham, he never saw. Now think of that. When you hear someone say, well, I tried God for a couple of years. It didn't work. Mm -hmm. Well, I know what he said, but it really it didn't come to pass. So then you have the people today who are saying, hey, he's not coming. I've heard that over and over and over again. Yeah. It's not going to happen. Everybody keeps saying that. <laughs> but he's, what does the Bible say? They're ignorant. Willfully ignorant. Willfully ignorant. Abraham was a great man of faith, as we'll see. So he's going to use Abraham to, to use as their example. They brought him up. And he said, okay, I'll use him. He said, I want you to know the whole world is guilty. Every single one of us. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. They thought they could keep the law and be saved. And they couldn't keep the law. Why do you think God gave them 613 laws? To get it across to them. I mean, you read some of the Old Testament, you think, well, that's kind of dumb. I mean, you can't pick up 10 sticks. You can't take more than 20 steps. You know? I mean, you look at it and you think, wow, that's, that's really dumb. God wanted them to see. And, and what did he tell them? If you break one, you're guilty of all of them. Boy, where's the peace of God in that? <laughs> He said, there's no peace. You people don't even know peace. I'm pretending like I have them sitting here in front of me. <laughs> <laughs> you have no peace. You don't even, you don't know what peace is. And you can just see these rabbis and these, 
these Pharisees, and, and Paul says, hey, I'm a Pharisee of the Pharisee. Mm -hmm. You talk about the law, I know the law inside out. You know, so they couldn't look at him and say, well, what do you know? <laughs> mm -hmm. He knew more than they could possibly know. He could speak more languages than they could possibly speak. This is what God called him. From idolatry, God called him from legalism. God called him from all of that. Knocked him down, so to speak, and he even blinded him so he could see. Can you imagine? He blinded him so he could see. <laughs> so Paul is telling him that by the law came the knowledge of sin. Do you understand that he gave all these laws to help you see that you can't keep them, that you're not perfect? That you are guilty if you break one, you broke them all. <clears throat> this is why not just ten commandments, then he gave you six over six hundred more laws just to show you this. That you are a sinner. And, and I always go back to Isaiah chapter 5 when he says, What else could I do? Did you ever think about that? Where God says, What more can I do? The feast days were to show you the Lord. The holy days was to show you the Lord. The sacrifices were to show you the Lord. It was all to show you the Lord. The tabernacle was the Lord. But you didn't see it. He says, you don't understand. None of that is going to save you. They were getting more and more angry at him. He said, the law was given to you to, to help you understand. This is why, this is why they didn't go to heaven when they died. Abraham did not go to heaven when he died. Okay? Adam did not go to heaven when he died. David did not go to heaven when he died. Although they were saved by faith, in believing God, they were saved. It was the grace of God. We see Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Why? Because he believed. But see, we have this easy believism today. Oh yeah, I believe in God. Oh yeah, I believe in Jesus. Mm -hmm. So yeah. But that that doesn't mean they're saved. They have to receive that. Just like he told them in chapter 2. Just because you are a Jew and just because you're born of Abraham don't mean you're a Jew. It's a matter of the heart. Your circumcision was a sign that sin is passed from generation to generation to generation. It's a circumcision of your heart that I want. You see what he was saying to them? It's a circumcision of your heart that God wants. That's what makes you a Jew. Your baptism, your speaking in tongues, your signing a paper that you're a member of the church, you're being born into the Catholic Church or Episcopalian Church or Baptist Church, you're being dedicated. None of that saves you. None of it. And here's Paul's telling them, listen, Abraham was saved because he believed God. And by the grace of God, God saved him. He said, none of these things are going to save you. Boy, the time that he came on the scene, he called of God to be an apostle, mm -hmm. a special apostle to the Gentiles. But he had to deal with these Jews because they didn't want the Gentiles in the church unless they were circumcised. You know? And he, he spoke very hard. Very hard. And sometimes you have to do that. Remember the story about the old farmer who kept hitting the donkey on the head with the bat. And then he, the mule, and he'd finally get the mule to go, and this guy watched him day after day after day. And he said, why do you hit that mule in the head with that bat? He said, I need to get his attention. You know? And sometimes God has to hit us in the head with a bat to get our attention. He said, therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now, he says, but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested. What? How could there be righteousness without the law? We have to keep that law, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ. Okay? Unto all and upon
upon all them that believe, for there is no difference, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. This is what he wanted all to see, the Gentiles and the Jews. Being justified freely by his grace, they did not understand that. There must be something else we can do. <laughs> We're saved on two good works. When you get saved, then you want to do good works. You want to serve the Lord. But even then, if you're not doing them for the right motive, you won't be blessed for them. You won't receive a reward. But you're saved on two good works. And I know I'm teaching you something you already know. You know these things. But Paul, Paul was telling him, no, you don't trust your, your religion. Don't, don't trust your baptism. Don't trust your church membership. Don't trust your works and all the good things that you do. Don't trust anything except Jesus Christ. <clears throat> There's nothing you can do, absolutely nothing that you can do to receive salvation. It is a gift of God. It is a gift. A complete gift of God. And all you do is ask. Ask. Look what he says. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace. How are we justified as though we had never sinned? By grace and grace only. You can't do it. No. You can't. The redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Whom God had set forth to be the propitiation. Now he gets into that. What is the propitiation? But see, most, I mean, anybody would say, who's a Christian, would say, Jesus Christ died for me. But in all reality, Jesus Christ had to die for God first. You understand what I'm saying? Right. Jesus Christ had to die for God before his righteousness could be accounted to us. He had to pay the debt. That's why they were still in paradise. He had to pay the debt before he could turn it to us. He had to die for God first because God demanded a pure sacrifice. He demanded that. That's why it's by grace, because God was going to pay the price. That's why he could act says that he winked at the sins before Christ came, that he passed over them. He passed over them. Why? Because the debt was going to be paid, because he was going to pay that debt. Okay? This is why. So what does propitiation mean? It means making peace with God. Making peace with God. A righteous God. That's what propitiation means. So when it speaks about the mercy seat, the, on top of the Ark of the Covenant, that it's a propitiation seat, that word is big, but what it means is peace offering. He was the peace offering to God. Before it could be accounted to us, he had to die for God. Now, don't you think about that? So he didn't just die for us. He had to die for God first to pay that debt, and then it goes to us and can be accounted unto us. The debt had to be paid first. Then this is why they were still in paradise, because they believed Abraham believed and it was accounted unto him for righteousness. He believed. They were like looking for him to come, and they believed, and their sins were covered, but not taken away until Jesus came. So he passed over them. That's what Passover was all about. He passed over them. Here they were in paradise, in the center of the earth. That's why it said he descended. He descended. He went into paradise. He didn't just come down to earth. When he died, when he, was, when he died on that cross, listen, he didn't go to paradise from the tomb. He went to paradise from the cross. Okay? That's like us. We won't go to heaven through the coffin. <laughs> Understand that? We won't go to heaven through the grave. 
We go to heaven the moment, the very second instant, as soon as you die. You go straight immediately into heaven. When Abraham died, he went to paradise. He went to paradise. When Jesus died on the cross, he went to paradise. To what? To lead captivity free and move them into the third heaven. That could not be done until he paid the price to the Father. Understand? That's why they said God winked at it. Or, or that's kind of the funny thing of God winking. God winked at it. God passed over that, those sins. Why? Because acts of faith. Now, it doesn't mean that every Jew who ever slew a sheep mm -hmm. went to paradise. <laughs> it was the faith that was in their heart. Mm -hmm. See, God sees the heart. Someone could appear very spiritual on the outside. Mm -hmm. And like he said, you're a sepulcher. <laughs> Okay? You appear beautiful on the outside, but on the inside, you're really dirty, just a bunch of dead bones. The Jews, who were true Jews, who truly believed God, when, when a sacrifice was made, it was made as an act of their faith in Him. That He, he was going to come. He was going to pay their debt. So when heaven, when Jesus died on that cross at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, he immediately went into paradise. Okay? And when he went into paradise, it was to announce to them, it is finished. It is done. And he said, he led captivity free and took them into the third heaven. That's why Paul, on, on the road where they stoned him, and he said he, he died and he went into the third heaven. And it was so awesome and so beautiful and so wonderful that he couldn't even give the words. He couldn't speak what was before him and what we have for us. What's coming for us? The best is yet to come. So they had to stay in paradise till he paid the price, took his blood into heaven. And so he died for God first, do you understand? Yes. And then it could be accounted unto us. A God had to be appeased before they could be taken out of paradise and moved into the third heaven. So now, when you die, you go immediately into the presence of the Lord. You don't go to paradise because paradise has been moved to the third heaven. Because of what Christ did. Can you see Paul explaining this to the Jews? Yeah. <laughs> you know, and they're saying, well, wait a minute. Uh, what about our five daily sacrifices? He's, you don't even understand what you're doing here. You can sacrifice and kill every lamb that ever took a breath and still split hell wide open. He said, it's your faith. Abraham did not keep the law. There was no law. Okay? And they said, oh, yeah, well, he knew in his heart that there was a law, and he just kept it. He didn't know that. No. But he knew God. Through faith. Right. By grace. Grace. His marvelous grace. That's the only way anybody ever got saved. From Adam until this very day, there's no way to get saved except by grace, through faith, believing in Him, plus nothing else. Amen. Nothing else. I don't care how spiritual it is. <laughs> Communion cannot save you. Baptism cannot save you. Serving in every church from here to Hong Kong cannot save you. And this is what He told the Jews. Your five daily sacrifices, your day of atonement, you can kill all those lambs. It means nothing unless it comes from here. Your circumcision, if it's not the circumcision of the heart, <laughs> the circumcision of the flesh was to show you you needed more work. That sin was passed on from generation to generation and you needed the circumcision of the heart. Baptism was what? A sign to show that you needed to be buried. You needed to die with him, be buried with him, and rise again with him to a new eternal life. To identify with him. 
It doesn't save you. It doesn't save you. You have to be saved before you go under that water. But how many people are going to hell today because they believe they were baptized? They were baptized. You always think immediately of the Catholics. They're not the only ones. They're not the only ones who believe that. That, oh yeah, I've been baptized, I'm saved. No, I was baptized one time and wasn't saved. I was baptized twice. Because the first time I was baptized, it didn't mean a thing to me. Well, I actually did. I was making mom happy. I mean, I'm just being honest with you. The whole family was being baptized. I, I wanted to make mom happy. And my little brother, he got baptized too and meant nothing to him. Nothing. We were just making mom happy. We were. But then when I got saved, then I wanted to be identified with him. I wanted to obey his word. I wanted to be baptized. I wanted to show as an outward an outward show of an inward work that really took place. And yeah, I had to get up before the whole church and tell them I had been playing church. <laughs> and that I was not saved. And then I got to tell them how I really got saved. You know? Because we need to understand it's here. Not here. And not in what we do. It's here. And this is what Paul is telling us. You're justified by grace. It's a declaration from God Almighty. Okay? Look what he says. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all. Notice he keeps saying all. Them that believe, for there is no difference, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. <coughs> And that's why I say a lot of these Jewish, Messianic Jews, they call themselves, a lot of them, they have some great teaching, some of them. But you have to be very careful, because when they're saying you want to get back to your Jewish roots, some of them are saying we need to return to keeping those feast days. We need to return to keeping those laws. And that's exactly what these Jews were saying in the first century of the church. Well, yeah, we take Christ, but we want this too. It could be only Christ alone, <coughs> plus nothing else. Not seven sacraments. <laughs> not, not this and this and this and this. Christ alone and nothing else. This was his message. And that all the world was guilty and there was only one way. Whom God has set forth to be the propitiation, the peace offering between man and God. It's like, and I've seen that picture many times with the hand stretched out to man and the hand stretched out to God. He is our propitiation. He is not only the sacrifice, He is the one who makes the sacrifice. He is the propitiation, the sacrifice offering. I mean, He's all in all. <laughs> he's the high priest, He's the ark, He's the lamb. He's it all. They didn't need anything else, and we don't need anything else. But Christ and Christ alone, whom God has set forth to be the propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past. Through the forbearance of God. I mean, these Jews are saying, wait a minute, wait a minute. <laughs> He says, to declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. They say, but what about keeping the law? What about the sacrifices? What about the circumcision? What about the covenants? What about all this? And what does he say? Where is the boasting? Because it's not of works. It's none of those works. It's by grace and grace alone. He is just and the justifier of all men. The unrighteous. The unrighteous. And so wait a minute. He's, they've got to be. He said, well, where is the boasting then? It is excluded. It's taken away. There's no boasting. You can't walk around and say, look at me. I'm wearing this thing in the middle of my head and it has God's word on it. You come to my house and you're going to find God's word on the door. I mean, Look at me. Look at my costume. Look what I'm wearing. Look what 
what I've done today. Look at what I did last week. <laughs> yeah. said, where, where is the boasting? It is excluded by what? The law of works, nay, but by the law of faith. <laughs> so you can see how the Jews, after sacrificing for all those years, nearly 2,000 years, and they're looking at him now and saying, you're preaching a different gospel. You're preaching a different... They accused him of preaching against God, of attacking God, of attacking the temple, of attacking the Jews and the law. Hmm. And these were the believers. <laughs> okay? Think about this. And he's, therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. That just kind of rubbed him the wrong way. It, is he the God of the Jews only? Well, no. I mean, he's asking them the questions. It, is God only the God of the Jews? Here's all, here's all my little dude. He said, is, is he not also the God of the Gentiles? Yea, uh, of the Gentiles also, seeing it is one God. Mm -hmm. One, yeah. Yes. Yeah. There's yeah. One God. Which shall justify the circumcision by faith and the uncircumcision through faith? Oh, well. I mean, they had many meetings to fight over the circumcision thing, you know? And, you know, in fact, in one of the meetings, he says, why don't you just all become eunuchs? I mean, he really pushed the point. He wanted to get the point across. He says, seeing it is one God which shall justify the circumcision by faith, if it wasn't done by faith, it meant nothing. Mm. Now let's think about that. How old were they when they were circumcised? Eight yeah. days old. How much faith is in front of them? You know, that's like baptizing a baby. Mm. What does that bad baby believe? Yeah. He said, do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid, yea, we establish the law. He said, we're actually honoring the law because it's the law that has taught us we need to be saved. We are honoring the law because it's the law that tells us that we are sinners and that we need that grace. We need to believe God. And then he goes on in chapter 4 to use Abraham. That's where we're going to start next week. Because, oh, they put all their faith in Abraham, their faith in obeying the law that Abraham knew nothing about. Right. They were kind of worshiping Abraham. Do you remember the story about the serpent, the brazen serpent that was raised? Oh. You know that they eventually ended up worshiping that serpent? They put the they actually put it up in Jerusalem to worship it. Oh. This is why he said, you don't even understand. You're not understanding this. <laughs> and so Romans explains what salvation really is and what comes along with the salvation, the justification, the sanctification, the glorification, the, all of it, the propitiation. But he died for God first. Then he could be passed on to me. That's what he wanted to get across to them. He died for God oh. to pay a debt that we cannot pay. Just now, if you want to try and pay that debt, you'll spend eternity in hell trying to pay a debt you can never pay. You can never pay. So that's why I think how exciting it must be for a Jew who finally does get saved and then looks back on all those things and saw, wow, what more could God have done? He gave us the tabernacle, which speaks of Jesus. He gave us the feast days, which gave us the whole dress rehearsals for everything that was going to happen. I mean, what more could he do? We had a visible appearance of him all the way 40 years through the desert. We had a visible presence of him when he would enter the tabernacle. And if they could say, what more? Isaiah said, what more could he have done? You know, I have to look at our country. What more could God have done for us than what he has done? And yet, we're turning down in our places of higher education, we're turning down speakers because of their stand on biblical standards. We're, we're chasing them out 
not allowing them to speak, and calling in Snooky and calling in Jane Fonda, who actually should have been tried and shot. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, forgive her, yeah, forgive her, and then shoot her. <laughs> huh. But she should have been tried and shot because she committed that crime. Yep. Okay.